uh, who's brave enough to just introduce themselves and in 10 seconds say what they're working on? There we go. Great. All right. It's fun. I'm just wallpaper. Yeah. We're custom printed wallpaper for um, commercial clients as well to business to computer data to customers. Yeah. And I started a second website which is called Beautiful Prints, like photo prints. Um, on self adhesive I love it. And you were here last time, right? Good one? You were here last time that I was here, right? No, I you sure? Yeah. Really? Okay. I mean, Somehow I remember that. Right. Right. <laughs> well, hopefully that's not too much of an indication of how, how the talk went. Uh, who else? Yeah, there we go. Hi, uh, I'm Desiree. That's right. Um, I'm actually building a system called One to One Practice, and what that is is a booking system for natural therapy clinics. And it allows the practitioners and the customers to book appointments online, and it's also a marketplace as well. I love it. I love it. Cool. Okay. Good. For us. Yeah. I'm launching a skincare brand in December. Say it again. A skincare brand. Yep. Okay. But I'm building it up on sushi. Right. So you have literally a packaged product of yeah. skincare. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, but like you said building it up through the social side of things here is bad. Awesome. Good. Good. Couple others. Yeah. My name's Cameron. Um, I've built the aspects of the clean science. Nice. Really. There's probably some really interesting stats and data on how disgusting it is. It's pretty scary. Yeah. So, yeah. It's sad that I money anymore. Yeah. 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 That's brilliant. Love that. Cool. Yeah. Uh, my name is Apu, and I'm setting up a platform for organizations where employees can teach each other rather than hiring external corporate trainers. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, that's something we do at Google as well. And uh, I, I just sat in a meeting yesterday, um, and we had just in one quarter um, in our office, got just under a thousand people in our office, and uh, we had five thousand attendees um, in our internal Google to Google session. So employees teaching other uh, employees, and yeah, it's a fantastic resource. And it's just and anything you may be interested in. You know, it's not just work stuff. Uh, yeah, I think it's great because you have this cool knowledge of information, and employees should be sharing that with each other. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. All right, and one more. <coughs> yeah. My name is Fritz. I work at Ride Surfing over here in the marketing, and we're uh, here to be a ride sharing application for smartphones. Great. Great. I love it. Um, well, one of the things that, one of the common threads that I heard from that, um, as you know, we're talking about what you're doing, I hear a lot of uh, platforms, social, um, and actually it's marketplace, um, things like that. and. To me, that is one of the most exciting things about this time and what we're doing. So before I joined Google, uh, which is about five years ago, and so I started off in the US, I can accent betrays me, hopefully you can forgive me. I do say things like mobile now instead of mobile. <laughs> or I, I say NZ instead of ANC. It's funny because when I talk to my friends back in the States, it all sounds very pretentious to them. They're like, oh, yeah, you're so cool living in Australia now. And you picked up the accent. Look at you. Um, so anyway, I started off in the States, um, managed some teams there. Then I moved to our European offices and managed our emerging markets. So my teams covered Africa and Middle East, Turkey, Spain, Portugal. That was really fun. And then came over here just over a year ago to manage our Australian and New Zealand business. But before I joined Google, I spent seven years with the startup. Uh, from the very beginning, getting funding, even just small funding, uh, hiring people, implementing, doing all of that. So entrepreneurship is absolutely in my blood. And I eat, I breathe, I sleep startups. I love it. It's, it's my absolute passion. When people talk about, you know, what do you do on the weekend to get away from work? A lot of people do triathlons or you know golf or hobbies or whatever. I do business. I do books. Uh, I work on my ideas, um, and so it's it's an absolute honor, and I mean that quite sincerely, to be here today and to talk to all of you, because for you know all the kids out there who have you know NRL heroes or uh, you know Olympians that they look up to, um, you are all my heroes, like, and, I, and, I, and I, that sounds 
kind of sappy and sarcastic when it comes out, but I really honestly mean that. I, I get chills when I think about what each one of you is doing on a daily basis. When we think about what this country will look like in the next five or 10 years, when we think about what the world will look like in the next five or 10 years, it's all of you that make that happen. It's all of you that have taken that risk to forego that paycheck when your, your best mate has just graduated from law school and they just got into this prestigious law firm and their parents are so proud, your parents are proud of them, and, I, and, and, and you're talking to people and they're saying, oh, what are you doing? And you're saying, oh, I'm working on this startup. And then they give you kind of this you know, nice pat on the back, like, you know, we just got you contracted some illness, or you know, I used to equate it to um, starting up a, a band in high school. You know, it's like, oh, good, yay! You know, every other kid is doing that. It's, it's, it's like we've viewed what it takes to do a startup as um, it's almost this flippant, uh, you know, following of, a, of an interest or a sidetrack. When in truth, you all are the ones that shape the way we're going to live. Last night I, I watched a TED talk on vulnerability, which is incredible. Renee Brown, if you haven't seen this, she did a first one on vulnerability and then followed it up with one on shame. And she talked about how when you look at the people that actually make a difference in the world, it's not the ones who are weak, it's not the ones who are afraid to put themselves out there. It's actually the vulnerable people, the people who are willing to take that step out into the unknown, willing to be exposed a little bit, willing to have somebody give them a patronizing pat on the back when it's your friends and colleagues and contemporaries who are the ones going out and getting these prestigious opportunities. And so anything that's creative, anything that's innovative, anything that's daring and world-changing comes from that point of being vulnerable. And that's, that's we're all in right here. It's, it's almost like this is one big support group. And, you know, in the daily stresses of waking up in the morning and answering that voice in the back of your head and saying, well, why are you doing this? Why, right? Why not just stop and take the easy road? Why not just stop and go get that paycheck? Why not just stop and stop feeling that churn in the pit of your stomach that keeps you up at night when you're trying to figure out what it's going to look like a year from now, whether you've succeeded or fallen flat on your face. So that's why I'm here today, and that's why it really is an honor to talk to you and a privilege. Because if there's nothing else, I want to try and arm you with a few things that at least give you a little bit of an increase in the chance of success. There's nothing else, and that's what I want you to walk away with. I want you, to, want you to walk away with a couple of strategies, a couple of tactics that you can go back, have a think about, try, measure, implement, rinse and repeat, like the lean startup, and, and start getting your organization, your startup on this track where it scales, where things start to happen beyond the time you're putting into it, beyond, beyond the time that you're working on it, then all of a sudden you start to see this creation of your own take on a life of its own. That's what I want today. All right. So let's get into it and talk just a bit on how you actually go about doing that. So I'm going to apologize in advance if at any point this gets a little bit too much in the weeds or a little bit tactical. Um, but I'm willing to take that risk with you because we're not going to really talk about actual strategies unless we dig into some of it. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, and then I'm happy to come back again and I can do a session like last time where we revisit some of the more strategic and big picture uh, parts of things. But to start off, let's just talk about marketing for a second. Um, I majored in marketing at uni, um, and after an entire degree, I still don't really after coming out of that, I didn't really know what marketing was about. You know, finance was pretty clear, law was clear, medicine was clear, but marketing has this like fuzziness to it. Feels very intangible. And yet, with a startup, we're supposed to talk about customer acquisition rates and social marketing and viral rates. So, what does that mean? And what does that mean, especially now in the 21st century? I talked about 
a second ago how exciting it is to be doing all of this right now and not 10 or 15 years ago. Because by doing it right now, you have access to a global audience. You have access to a national audience. You have an access to your perfectly niche targeted customer. And that didn't exist 15 years ago. So that's what I want to talk about today from a marketing perspective. Because when we think about marketing, we tend to think back to a 20th century model, which is much more of what we would call a push model. And we'll talk about that in a second. Push models started in the 1920s, uh, especially in the US, where you had this economic boom and all of these FMCG products that were just starting to go out to the masses. So it was the first time when uh, a large mass market was thinking about things like shampoo and toothpaste and soap. And these companies were realizing, wow, we can actually market these products and people will buy them every single week, every single month. This is amazing. In fact, a little tidbit of why, uh, you know, do you, do you use the term soap operas? Have you heard that term here, right? You wonder, ever wonder why these dramas during midday got the term soap opera? It's because literally back in the radio days and the television days, soap companies would put on these radio or television operas, these dramas that went on on a weekly basis, and they were sponsored by the soap company. So the idea was, if you had this domestic audience that was at home during the day, listening to the radio, watching TV, they're the audience that you're looking for that are going to buy soap. So let's give them something entertaining to listen to or to watch, and then hopefully they buy our soap. So that worked. That worked in the 1920s and the 30s and the 40s, and that worked for these mass audiences. But for some reason, as we went through the 50s and 60s of the Mad Men and Don Draper days, went on through into the 80s, 90s, we kept this mindset of a 20th century marketing model. This mass marketing thing where we're trying to reach an audience of millions of people or a billion people and forcing them or, or trying to change their perception so that they're going to buy this product and they didn't know they need it. That's not the same. That's not what we're talking about in the 21st century. That's much more of a pull model where you're going to take the initiative, take the, the push that people are interested in, and try and use that to le leverage that momentum to your strength and grab that audience. All right. So that's what we're going to talk about as we talk about marketing in a digital world. It's a completely different model than how it was in the 20th century. So you're going to see me talk a lot about Google things. Um, I'm not here to, to sell or represent Google. I'm here to talk about startups and to talk about all of you. So um, I apologize that these are Google focused, um, but hopefully this can be really informative and helpful. So as I mentioned, we're going to start with some basics and go through some of the elements and apologies to the people who already know this and get this, but I thought it'd be good for us all to be on the same page of what search engine marketing is all about. You'll hear that term SEM, that's search engine marketing, SEO, search engine optimization. The difference is the space on the page. And some of these slides are a little bit older in terms of layout. You can see that ads look a little bit different today. But basically, if it's a sponsored ad like this, that is search engine marketing. If it's what we call an organic uh, link, in terms of the natural search results that come up, that's search engine optimization. So I help and focus on the SEM side. Uh, we can always do another session on the SEO side, and that would be a different team or different personality. But that's the difference between the two. Okay? And we're gonna get into the details of how you use this and what you need to do to take advantage of, of that. You'll also hear things called display marketing or display advertising. Um, this used to be called banner advertising. You'll still hear people refer to that today as a banner ad. That goes way back to the you know, 1990s, the late 90s, as the internet was just getting out there, and you would land on a site, and it would be this obnoxious, flashing you know, banner up there saying, You've, you're one out of a million, you've won, click here to see more. Obviously, it's a gimmick. Um, that's all changed to something that's an incredibly intelligent, incredibly targeted platform and system 
that helps build an audience of awareness for the things that you're focusing on and grab people that may not even know about you. So remember I said the three things we wanted to do today, talk about how you get the people that are looking for you, talk about how you get the people who don't know about you, all right? and then how do you measure and implement and test that. This one is that second category, capturing people who don't know much about you. And again, we'll just touch on that part today uh, and set things up for another talk about that. And then similar to that is video ads or platforms like YouTube, where as people are watching and viewing content, you can actually show them an ad, a little video, a little educational snippet about what you do. It's interesting about this, you've probably seen it as a user, um, you can skip that ad. You as the viewer can choose to skip that. And as an advertiser, you're not built that way. It's, it's one of these amazing things that's changing how people think about marketing. The whole point of marketing in the 20th century was how do you get a message across to somebody that doesn't necessarily want to hear from you. Now it's about how do you only pay to reach the people who voluntarily are agreeing to listen about your product or your service. And that's what's starting to revolutionize things like video advertising, and it's changing actually how television advertising works. Because advertisers now are thinking about how do I create something that's engaging right literally in the first five seconds that grabs people's attention. It's completely different, completely different to how we think about things before. All right. So let's get into AdWords itself. Now AdWords encompasses all of that stuff, but we tend to think of it most often in terms of the search engine marketing, the first slide that we looked at. So if there are a few things that AdWords offers and search engine marketing offers that can help you with your business. All right, so as I mentioned, pull rather than push. So you're grabbing interest from people that are already looking for you or looking for a product similar to yours. Paying only for the performance, so you've often heard pay per click. If you're an advertiser this way, you're only charged if somebody actually clicks on an ad to come to your site. Okay. Real time reporting, we're going to talk about that towards the end with analytics to measure and see the impact of that. Immediate feedback from testing that. Uh, if, again, if this were 15 years ago, you'd have to launch a campaign, commit tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to that campaign and then cross your fingers that this is going to work. Now you can do that in hours, even in minutes if you have enough traffic. So um, you're, <laughs> this, is, this is another interesting thing that I get questions about um, that we'll, we'll touch on a bit, but how this auction system works. Like, What does it actually cost to run an ad uh, on a search? That's an interesting question, and there's not a direct answer to it since it's set up as an auction model. But we'll talk about how that actually works and how you can try and test and figure out what that actually costs you. Um, being rewarded for relevance. I often give the example that if you're um, searching for Lady Gaga tickets, you don't want to see an ad for 20% um, you know, off discount at uh, Meyer or David Jones. Right? It's completely irrelevant to what you're looking for. So the entire system is set up so that only the right information, only the right ads are set up to show against the people who are looking for things. So if somebody's searching for wallpaper, that's an opportunity for, their, for them to see your ad. But if they're searching for shoes, no, right? You don't want to be wasted on that audience, so it's completely relevant. Precise targeting on focusing on the right people, the right time, and so on, and then the scale that I talked about earlier. So let's talk about how you reach people. This is one of those things that's a bit of a catch-22 when I talk to startups. Um, you've, you've probably gone through sessions and read books and uh, had discussion groups on how you target your ideal customer, your ideal audience, right? So you've gotten that advice of, um, you know, you start off thinking, I've got seven billion people on Earth that could potentially benefit from what I do. You think that's my audience, seven billion people, right? And then you know you think about it and you work walk through it and you think, okay, well I've got skincare, so even though every single human being on Earth uh, cares about their skin or at least should, maybe my audience isn't seven billion. So what is your audience? So then you start thinking, well maybe I should start with Australia. 
Maybe I should start with Sydney. Maybe I should start with a very particular kind of person in Sydney, a demographic, all of that. Well, targeting your search engine ads allows you to specify how you do that and who you target, who you focus on. Okay, so you can even bring it down to, in certain markets in the States and, and here, like a very precise local level, not just Sydney, but certain areas within Sydney. And the great thing about that is that it provides you the opportunity to test, measure, implement, iterate, and optimize. So if you start with a target audience of just, a, let's say, Piermont within Sydney, then you're not going to risk a whole lot. You can see what's working, then expand it to Sydney. Then see how things are working in Sydney. Optimize off of that. Expand it to New South Wales. Measure that. Expand it to Australia. And so on and so forth. That gives you the opportunity to control exactly who you're going after. And this actually ties into one of the things I, I mentioned last time I spoke. I talked about the myths that I had when I did my startup. I didn't do a single dollar of digital advertising when I had my startup. So, so it's one of the great ironies of me working at Google is I came into Google having come from a startup where I did zero digital marketing. And the reason I did zero digital marketing is because I had somebody work for Google there from a, um, a, a reseller who had talked about what digital marketing was all about, and I, I just didn't understand how that related to my business. I ended up having these three myths that I just really couldn't get across. One of those myths was targeting the right person. I thought, well, if I'm advertising on the internet, and this was you know, more than 10 years ago, say, say, well, it was 12 years ago, um, if I'm advertising on the internet, I don't want to pay for everybody in the world that's going to be searching for anything related to what I do. That's way too big. That's way too much money. So I didn't realize you could actually turn it to a very specific audience. I don't want you to have that same misunderstanding. The way you then do that, and the way you make sure that your ad shows up to people, is by choosing a group of keywords. All right, so let's go back to the skincare um, solution. So um, let's say people are searching for skincare. Do you want to show up against that search? You might say yes right away. It seems kind of an obvious question, right? If people are searching for skincare, I want them to see my product. But I would give that a qualified yes, because as we'll see in a minute as we talk about the auction, the broader your keywords are, the more people are going to be trying to go after that. So skincare could include soap, skincare could include lotion. Skincare can include um, sun cream. Skincare can include a whole host of different products. And if yours is targeted against a very specific um, type of product, you don't want to be competing, especially against the big players who are trying to capture that audience for skincare. So when you think about your business and what it is that your service, your product has to offer, think about more specifically what your product offers. So my recommendation is that you would want to have a group of keywords that are probably three to five words long. Okay, so in skincare, skincare would be too generic, it'd be way too expensive, way too broad for you as a startup to crack into that audience. So let's say it's focused on um, lotion, just to pick that up. Tell, tell me, so what part of skincare is your product focused on? Okay. Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Almost Is it like an anti-aging serum? Yeah. Yep. Yep. There you go. There you go. So, um, and what's your name again? Yep. So, you mentioned how um, it's one of many qualities. So, think about your product. Think about your service. What you do, and break it down into maybe three different product qualities. Three different product offerings. Even in employee to employee education, you know, think about what it means to have um, peer to peer learning. Think about what it means to have ongoing education. Think of what it means to be personal, you know, personal development and that side of things. All the different option, options and product features that you know about your service, group those into about three sections. 
and then take those qualities and de develop a list of keywords that if somebody was searching for something relevant to that, you would want them to see your ad. So we talked about anti-aging serum. That's a great keyword now, as opposed to skincare. We talked about organic and natural. Those are great keywords. Organic anti-aging serum, or natural anti-aging skin cream. Australian anti-aging skincare, and a mixture of those. And then Google has this really cool tool called the Keyword Tool, where as you type in some of those keywords, it'll actually make suggestions based on past search behavior and search patterns to suggest to you, you may want to consider these other keywords. So you have to start developing this list pretty quickly of, say, maybe 25, 50 keywords that explain this specific quality of your product. And then as you're thinking about this, it's probably starting to become obvious that as then users are searching for that, then there's an opportunity for your ad to show up. Okay? And don't worry about small amounts of traffic early. That's exactly what you want. You want to start with the targeted niche groups where you're maybe getting 50 clicks um, over a period of time. And then based on that, you're measuring it and figuring out how do I expand that to 100. Rather than starting huge, really large, and then trying to hone in on it, you want to start small and then branch out. Okay. So um, this was one of the, the second myths that I have about controlling budget. I thought, that, you know, there's this commercial that used to show in, in the States where it was this, this startup team. And the commercial is a point of view from their laptop, from the computer screen. And it's launch day. So all the people in the startup are gathered around the, the laptop screen, and they're so excited about what's going to happen. They hit the launch button, and then um, they wait a couple seconds, and the first order comes through. And they're popping the champagne, they're thrilled, they're all excited, and then the second order comes through, and the third order, and then you know, it's a dozen orders. And they're going crazy, and they're loving this, it's exceeding their expectations, they're going nuts. And then all of a sudden the counter starts ticking up and they're at you know hundred thousand and a million and now they're just freaking out and they're, they're just baffled at what they're going to do here. Um, I used to think about that from a marketing standpoint, from a budget standpoint. You know what happens if I launch that ad and I get a couple of clicks and I'm so excited that people are actually interested. And then I get 10 clicks, and then I'm thinking, okay, this is good, I like where this is going. And then I get 100 clicks and 1,000 clicks, and I wake up the next day, and I'm just blown through you know, $10,000 that I don't have to spend. So the good thing is, you don't have to have that nightmare. When you set up your account, you set either on a month, you can do it on a daily budget as well. I do not want to spend any more than this. And as soon as the system, as soon as the ads hit that budget, so let's say you said, I don't want to spend anything more than um, you know, $50 a day. As soon as enough ads are shown that um, the system hits that limit, your ads stop showing. Which could be bad. You may want your ads to continue, and you could adjust that the next day. But at least you're in control of it. You don't have to worry about the scenario where you wake up some day and then all of a sudden you have this $10,000 bill in right you that you didn't know about. You get to set your daily budget. Now, I think that often comes from that. People will ask me, you know, what, what would you recommend? Should I bid higher on the keywords? And again, we'll talk about the bids. Or should I set a higher budget overall? My recommendation is to set the overall budget that you're comfortable with and let that be your limiting factor. Let that be the thing where you don't go past that. And then when it comes to bidding on a keyword, it allows you to be a little more generous, a little more aggressive to get the right audience, to get the right traffic. And then if that only gets you, whatever, 10 clicks until you hit your budget, then so be it. At least you've got 10 right clicks. At least you've got the 10 right people coming to your traffic, to your website, rather than setting your budget, and then going for the very low end, the absolute cheapest uh, click, the cheapest ad, and then you may be able to get 100 people coming to your site. But if there are 100 wrong people, then why not? So we'll talk about that strategy when we get to it. That's my general advice when looking through that. So I mentioned 
relevance, and I mentioned how the ads work. Let's talk about how that plays out with uh, how the system actually decides how to show your ads. Okay? And I'll even click through to the next slide as well, where we talk about this thing called quality score. So let's go back to the uh, Lady Gaga example. And you're selling concert tickets. And as a promoter, you want to sell as many of those tickets as possible. So you put an ad out there for the next Lady Gaga concert coming to Sydney. And you want your ad to show up when people search for Lady Gaga. How do you do that? How do you know if your ad is going to show up? Well, it's based on two factors. One, and the, the, the most direct thing that it's tied to, is the bid that you're willing to pay for a click. And you'll see that annotated, you'll see that abbreviated as CPC, cost per click. So what you're going to do with that is then when you're uh, entering those keywords into the system, it's going to ask you what your maximum bid is. And any of you have bought something off eBay or anything like that, where you're entering your maximum bid, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to pay that. It's just what the auction system knows you're willing to go up to and nothing more. So in this case, let's say you say, I'm going to put in a maximum bid of $2. So I'm willing to pay $2 for any time somebody clicks on my ad and goes to my site. That's the main driver of how your ad shows up on the page. So. Um, if you bid two dollars and somebody else bid a dollar eighty, uh, and somebody else bid a dollar fifty, now the system's going to start ranking that, so your ad comes up on top. And those top three ad positions are really key. Those are the things that people are seeing first, so it's a great thing to be up on top. All the more reason why you want to focus on the niche audience, because if you're focused on a general audience, it's going to be way too expensive to try and compete in that space. Better to start with a very targeted audience. Get a healthy bid going for your keywords and then winning an auction. But there's a second thing that comes into play there, and that's this thing called quality score. Now, the reason that's there is that Google believes that it's a poor user experience if you're searching for Lady Gaga concert and you see an ad for shoes. That was the internet experience of 10 or 15 years ago. So the whole system is set up so that it's constantly measuring your ads as people are searching for things. And if people are searching and never clicking on that ad, it's starting to learn of how relevant your ad is to those keywords. And if it's not relevant at all, it's not going to show your ad. So the cool thing about this, and the way I like to, to present it, is that this is a leveling effect for the startups of the world. This basically means that a giant in your industry can't just come in and by cost alone just buy up every single ad space. You, know, you can't have a big FMCG company that just owns that no matter what. They, like you, also have to compete for quality score, which is why it's such a smart strategy to focus on a niche. Because if you're trying to compete in the skincare market, it's going to be really tough. If you're going to compete in the organic, natural, anti-aging, Australian-made skincare market, then you've got a really good shot. You can seek to dominate that market. And that's why quality score is so important to level the playing field against larger players and the companies that are somewhat relevant to it. So we talked about how you choose keywords. You want them to reflect your product and service. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what's called an ad group. Remember when I asked you to think about the three different ways to position your product and the features? That would be a, an organization of thinking about ad groups. And then with each one of your ad groups, then you would have multiple keywords to explain that part of your product. You want to match what your audience is looking for, and you want to do it without being too general, especially from a cost perspective. So this kind of goes back to the skincare thing that I was talking about. About if you're selling dog food online, you don't want to grab people that are just looking for these very general terms. You want to buy. You want to look for things that are very specific related to your product and what you're going after. Another thing you can do there um, is do what's called a negative targeting. So what does that mean? Again, to, to use the analogy here, let's say somebody was typing in cheap 
um, Australian-made skincare. Now, I'm going to guess that because you're, you've got a really great uh, product with natural organic uh, ingredients, you're going for more of the, the luxury market. People are willing to pay a little bit more for a better quality experience. Is that right? right? So you're not trying to go to the very bottom end of the market and discount you know, the cheapest thing you can buy. So because of that, you may put in a negative keyword for the word cheap. Which means that if somebody is searching for cheap Australian skincare, they're not going to see your ad. Now you think, well, don't I want to show my ad to everybody that's even remotely interested? No, no, you don't, especially not right now. That would be a different conversation if you had an unlimited budget. If you had millions and millions and millions of dollars that you could spend. Yeah, then you want to start widening your audience. And you may try and convince that person who's looking for cheap skincare, hey, come to our site and let's educate you on why you may want to spend a little bit more on our premium products. But that's down the road. You want to do, you want to grow into that audience. Early on, you want to try and weed out as many people that are on the exterior fringe of your market as possible. Don't waste your money on grabbing them right now. Let's go after them next. Right now, you want to grab the audience that's looking for high-end, premium, luxury, organic, those kind of things. You want to grab that audience. So having a negative keyword is a great way to do that. And make sure you're using your ad dollars the most effectively. We're going to actually talk about a term called conversion in a second, and then I'll reinforce that in the analytics section. But that ties into people actually purchasing things on your site. So um, some simple do's and don'ts, and I see a lot of you taking notes here. Um, I'll, I'll work with Pandora, and hopefully, uh, as I check through this, um, it's something I can share so that you guys can have this as a resource to refer to. So if you're missing any of the stats I'm looking for right here, um, I'll come through with that. So this kind of repeats what we saw earlier in the advice of multiple keywords, um, targeted, relevant to the people who are searching for it, and adding negative keywords to weed out the people that may be on the fringes. Right, now we put on the actual advertiser app. How are you going to write a specific ad that's going to grab the right audience? Good, good question. Now, you've got a limited number of key characters or letters that you can use to do this, and the, the tool and the system will do that for you so you can see what's going on. Um, but this is really the key of delivering an ad that is going to be the most relevant to your audience. We talked about the keywords doing that with the searches, now the actual ad is going to play a difference. All right? Um, the, the best advice I can give here is to have ads that include the key words of what people are searching for. Now, it may sound obvious, um, but you'd be amazed at how verbose and how abstract people get in writing ads that aren't relevant. So, you know, here's an ad. We're the, the best, you know, skincare product around and come visit our site so you can find out what makes us so great. That ad doesn't talk anything specifically to what people are searching for. So you want your ad to contain specific keywords related to the strategy you had earlier so that you're saying things like organic, you're saying Australia-made, you're saying luxury, you're saying anti-aging, serum, all of that. That's what you want in your ads. And when we talk about um, the display side of things in the next session, the next time I come and talk, um, that's when you're really going to think about that audience that doesn't yet know about it. So, as I heard what you're doing, so your, your money in the antibacterial business, right? Um, it's not like people are waking up in the morning and thinking, I'm going to search for antibacterial solutions to the money I have in my pocket, right? So, they're not necessarily searching for that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that people aren't looking for you or looking for that audience, right? So um, on the display side of things, that's where you can have those, those visual image ads that are then, as a keyword is targeted to a search, those image ads are targeted to the content on the page. So you may have um, 
I don't know, let's say a, a doctor's office that's handling currency and money, right? The last place you want to have bacteria floating around and nasty money being exchanged is in a doctor's office. So you then may start thinking about, well, um, when are doctors thinking about payment systems, money? So then you start thinking about POS, point of sales services. I'm looking for point of sale solutions. Am I going to, you know, have an A and Z terminal at my checkout counter? Am I going to have cash register? What is it? Those are things that people are searching for. That's where you can start getting targeted on the search perspective. But then you're going to have an entirely different strategy of image ads that are going to show up against content that's related to what you do. So again, that could be a blog that talks about the most innovative solutions and payment systems. That could be a blog talking about health and what it means in the you know, antibacterial world of things. That's where you have the opportunity to start planting the, the seed in the minds of the people who are going to become your audience. And again, as I heard from a lot of you, you're developing businesses and platforms and markets of things that don't necessarily exist right now. And so that starts to begin to answer the question, how do I reach an audience that doesn't know I exist? That's how you begin to do it. So, just missed it. <laughs> I just missed the blog page. So coming back to that point of grabbing the people who are looking for you, this is an example of what I was mentioning. If you're selling figurines, you want figurines to show up in your app. That's, that's a simple, straightforward, Thing. You want to have a call to action. Um, you don't necessarily want to waste time on things that are a bit obvious. That's that's kind of the, the 101 level of thinking. Um, since you only have limited words, don't don't waste it on something like click here. People know that it's clickable. You don't have to teach people what it means to click. So don't use up two words with click here or business. They know they can visit you. If you didn't have a website, you wouldn't be here. So don't waste time on that. You really want to focus on that and call to actions. Um, I'll see a lot of people um, who are putting um, a sense of urgency or expiration. You know, um, uh, discount available until Friday. Something like that. Um, uh, discount available in, or you know, sale until October 12th, whatever it is. Um, so that you can start planting the mind, uh, planting the seed that that customer has the potential to click now, has the potential to take advantage of the sale or whatever you're doing. It doesn't have to be a sale, but it's something that calls to action in the short term and gets them to right now. Um, I'm going to skip over a bit here because we're going to talk about this in the analytics section. Um, but the best thing about what we're going to do here is on the reporting side. So let's chat about that. Um, this is where I want to chat about the idea of a conversion. So we talked about this a little bit last time. Um, a conversion is typically thought of as the sale or purchase on your website. So you're selling wallpaper, uh, I'm sure you're doing that you know, offline, you're talking to people offline, um, but let's say you had it available on your site, people can purchase it, um, a conversion would literally be it's wallpaper, right? Easy enough. Selling skincare online, they purchase it, conversion. Now, what about your platform where you've got peer to peer education in a work environment? What's a conversion? You know, there, it's, I, I used to work with uh, business to business companies that sold multi million dollar excavators and construction equipment. You know, people are going on to Caterpillar.com and buying two excavators, you know, get free shipping, you buy two, you know, or, you know, buy one, get one free. But, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't happen. So does that mean that a conversion doesn't exist or it's irrelevant? No. A conversion is, by definition, any action that you want your visitor to take on your site. That is a conversion. And the good thing is that you have the luxury of having more than one conversion on your site. In fact, now that you have the luxury, I would certainly recommend that you have more than one conversion activity on your site. So what about your platform where you want them to reach out to you to um, 
you know, set up a meeting or get a quote or talk about you know uh, implementing this at, at the office. You could set up that um, you know request a meeting here, set that up as a conversion head. You could have um, you know download our app to start working now. That's a conversion app. That's a conversion app. You could have um, uh, you know. Yes, I'm going to use the term click here, but click here to, to give us a call, and then you set that up as a conversion. Now, what's cool about analytics is that that is software running in the background of your site. Does anybody use analytics right now? Yeah? Great. Awesome. Um, so that's software that's running in the back of your site to tell you what is happening to the traffic there. Now, the cool thing is that that integrates completely with the AdWords platform that you have. So analytics standing alone will tell you you're getting traffic from Facebook, you're getting traffic from um, search, you're getting traffic from people going directly to your site. All of that information is there. Then you connect the system to your AdWords, and now you start to see an entire journey of your customer coming to your site and then what they're doing once they're there. So you can see, wow, actually, when I have the ad that says anti-aging, organic anti-aging serum, not only is that the best performing ad in terms of the traffic that it drives, but actually I get the best click-through rate, which is the number of times people click after seeing the ad, that's your click-through rate. That gives you your traffic to your site. And then that last thing you want to measure is conversion rate. Out of the people that you drive to your site, how many actually request a click? Download it now. Purchase one. Now. That's your conversion, and now you can see the entire formula in Legend to be able to calculate what your return on investment is. For every one dollar that I spend, I get whatever two orders of wallpaper. For every dollar that I spend, I get a quote. For every dollar I spend, I get somebody requesting a meeting for a follow-up. Then you can start deciding how much you want to put into that, how effective it is, and what your return on investment is. So as I mentioned, this is 21st century marketing because this is information that's available to you for free as a startup that didn't exist again, 15, 20 years ago. So for those of you who have used analytics before, you're going to be entirely familiar with this page. Um, and I, could, I always feel guilty when, when I have a chat on this stuff because there's some of you in the room who this is second nature to you, you know exactly what analytics is about. For some of you, this is the first time you're seeing a page like this. So it's hard to, to know what is what in terms of the ideal amount of depth to go into. So I can always come back and do a session specifically on analytics. But what I want you to take away here is if there's nothing else you do with analytics, what would it be? So one thing that you should do with analytics. And that's effectively answering the questions on this page. So I work in sales. I work with customers. Um, I'm often talking to my team about knowing what your sales funnel is. So as a startup, you're wearing so many different hats. You're the founder, you're the marketer, you're the accountant, you're the operations guy, you're everything. So you don't have time to spend, you know, 100% of your week on marketing and analytics. So since you don't have that, and since you're not a full-time salesperson, what should you do? What should you take away from this? And my answer would be, know your sales funnel. Know your consumer's career path on your site. The way you do that is through the path section on analytics and through conversion events. So you'll see when you have the paths, that you'll start to get this, literally this funnel that says out of all the people that visit this site, here's where the majority of them first came, your home page. Here's where they went next, the product page. Here's where they went next, the checkout page. And here's where they went next, the, the purchase confirmation page or in a platform, here's where they went next, find out more information, here's where they went after that, contact us, reach out to us. Once you start knowing that formula and that funnel, that's when that 
that world of scale that I talked about starts to unlock and open up to you. Because now numbers are on your side. Now you're like an, an IBM, a big data machine. You can just start optimizing to that. You can start adjusting your strategy to see where are these people coming from? Are they coming from the CBD in Sydney? Are they coming from major cities in Australia? Are they coming from overseas? Where are they coming from? This funnel in this report is going to tell you. But then connecting that to the customers that are actually purchasing or contacting you, the ones that are actually going to be your clients and pay you revenue, that's the important piece of connecting it in the end. So that's why conversions and goals are so key with your goal paths to be able to know how that all plays out and what your formula is. That's the one takeaway I want you to think about from analytics. If you do nothing else this week, especially for those of you that have analytics and the ones that don't yet have it, figure out what that formula is and then ask yourself, what are the adjustments? What are the tweaks I can make there? There's a wonderful statistic that says if you make a 0.02% change on a daily basis, over the course of 365 days, one year, you double the results of what you're doing. 0.02%. It's beautiful because of compound interest. It's beautiful the math that's there. But the same thing is true with adjusting the variables on your site. If you can adjust the click-through rates by just a couple of points, if you can adjust your conversion rate by just a couple of points, if you can reduce your bounce rate by just a couple of points, it's not 2% of a difference. Each one of those compounds with one prior to it, and all of a sudden you're looking at 2x growth, 3x growth, 4x growth, that hockey stick curve that we all want to be in. That's what analytics is about arming you with information about your site, arming you with the data, so that this isn't just a busy screen full of numbers that you have to sift through. It's, it's not paralysis by analysis. It's truly arming you with information to scale your business. Arming you with information so that you're no longer buying yourself a job and a slave to a 40-hour work week that you thought you were. Arming you with information so that you break out of that one-to-one -one ratio of one hour of my time equals one hour of output in sales or traffic or results. It should be one hour of my time now gets me two hours of results. And then next month, one hour of my time gets me three hours of results, four hours. That's when you start to scale exponentially. That's what's attracted to investors. That's what's attracted to employees. That's what, that's what we're in this business to do, to scale beyond our individual efforts. So to close up on analytics and looking back on everything that we've talked about, measuring, implementing, um, understanding how AdWords connects to that, all of these things with your site, with navigation, I, I want to come back to what we were talking about at the very beginning of this call, with the idea of vulnerability and what you're doing. We were chatting before the session about what it's like to be a, a single entrepreneur. How many of you in this room are doing your startup on your own? It's just you. How many of you are doing it as a two or three person team? How many of you are doing it as a team of more than four people or more? Yeah. So in that case, even if it's four or five, you can see the vast majority of people in this room are either one, two, or three people trying to make a living off of this. One, two, three people that have to wake up in the morning, put themselves out there, and face the world without a boss saying, this is what you need to do without a to-do list saying, if you do this, you will succeed. Without some book or guideline or course guide that says, if you follow these rules, trust me, I promise, it's all going to work out. So the cost of being vulnerable like that, the cost of putting yourself out there, taking that risk, is the cost and price that you pay every single day 
in uncertainty and not knowing what the future holds. Bad news is that there's no answer to that. If it were easy, if there were a silver bullet, everybody would be doing this. And, and the opportunity wouldn't be there. We would have already lost. And the wonderful thing about this is that the fun of it is the challenge of it, right? You have your colleagues who are running these triathlons, doing you know all these things to stretch themselves, to see what are my personal limits. When you do that every single day that you wake up and come into here, every single day you focus on yourself. So my ask to you, my challenge to you, is that if we were to come back a year from now and talk about what we did to get 2x growth, 3x growth, 10x growth, I would want you to be able to tell me that you took enough action, enough small action, to increase your chances of success by 2% this week, or by 0.02% tomorrow. And that's why we talked about this. Whether it's marketing and finding people who are searching for you, whether it's being in front of the people who don't yet know that you exist, or whether it's being there and analyzing the information and the data that comes to you when people visit your site, so you can turn that back into growth, you are literally arming yourself with the tools to increase your chances of success, to be alive tomorrow, alive a year from now, scale that. So please don't forget that, and please don't think that what you're doing isn't something that is going to have an impact on your life, your family's life, this country's life. I can't stress that enough, that in the end, when you look at the people who change history, the people who look back on their deathbeds and say, I lived a life that was meaningful and purposeful and worth it, are the people who took the risk, stepped outside of their comfort zone, and decided to live for something greater than themselves, a passion that they had, and a passion to impact the world in a way that wasn't going to be in a desk job, sitting under fluorescent lights. That's what you're all doing today. So thank you for the time today. Thank you for learning from that. Hopefully there was something that you could catch up on. Um, if there's any bit of this that you'd like to dig into deeper, chat with Pandora, and again, I can do another session that digs in deeper to things and talk about display. Um, but I'll stick around for a few more minutes of Q&A. Unfortunately, I can't stay for lunch. But um, my name is Scott Simpson. I'm just up the road at Google. I'd love to have coffee or tea or chat with any of you anytime. As I said, that's the thing that I love the most. So please can't take me up on that. And uh, hopefully this was worth your time today. So thank you. Um, that you could ring them 
um, that you, you take it up on that and learn from that experience they have when they work on it, they look at your site and say, I'll try this, do that, and all that, come even back and say, in a week's time, we change things, and then you tell us if you like that. So it's, it's, they do quite a lot in the background as well, if you want, not just like on a one, one to one. I yeah. think that's a great opportunity, and hardly anyone, I don't know, maybe a lot of people don't know about that. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, because uh, it, it really is a great resource to have. Um, you know, AdWords was set up as a self-service platform. The idea is that anybody could go on there and start up their own uh, account, give it a try, and, and work with it. But as the system and as the platform has evolved over the years, it's become more and more complex, and there are more and more opportunities for you to, to work with and find the right strategy. So thanks for bringing that up, because there are a host of resources and help centers and YouTube videos to guide you with that. But it's useful to know that at some point you can literally email a team or reach out, and, and you can have that one-to-one -one help and resource that's there for you. So yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, now, yeah, take uh, these two, and then um, the reason I have to run, uh, I, my wife is pregnant, and October 20th is our due date, so uh, today's the last ultrasound. Yep, so I get to see uh, one nice little snapshot picture of uh, my, my soon-to-be baby girl. And uh, hopefully three weeks from now, we should get that. So right into that. So yeah, one, two. Go ahead. I'm also thinking of this any out-of-box uh, dashboard uh, kind of solutions that you recommend for analytics, particularly small businesses. Yep. Um, it, there are there are a couple of them out there. Um, some that cost money. Um, I would recommend, and I'm honestly not saying this because I work for Google, but to try analytics because it's free and use the basic features in that. Um, I would use that so long as you feel comfortable with it, and then, um, then investigate some of the, the paid options. I think it's, it's designed to, even up against the paid options, be a, a strong resource. There's, there's a thing called Analytics Premium um, that is a, a paid version of Google Analytics, but the only time I see um, people or companies using that is when they're massively, massively large. Like when you're getting you know, millions of hits on your site over a month. Um, unless you're at that size, the free version should be plenty capable to give you all the information you need. And then I guess the follow-up to that would be to um, not get distracted by all the information. That's probably the hardest thing about using analytics is you're just throwing so much information. And it's great to have all that data, but you want to pick, this is where um, the book of Lean Startup that I'm sure a lot of you have looked into is really helpful because you want to pick between three and five key metrics that you measure on a daily and weekly basis and focus on those. And then don't get distracted by every single report that's there. Use that as your dashboard and then work off of that. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, that's right here. That's right here. Yeah. Yeah. How do you think advertising Yeah. How does advertising going to change? Yeah. I think more and more um, information is going to come there. What we didn't talk about today was the power of mobile advertising, and more importantly, mobile information. Um, so whether it's Google, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Amazon, what have you, um, there's incredible information that exists from our behavior here. So, um, you know, if uh, if you're uh, a skin, if your skincare example, let's, let's take it, um, it could get down to the point where somebody is walking through the mall and the phone knows that they've just gone by Sephora or some kind of you know, retail store. And then you can tell the system that you want your ad to show up when somebody walks by one of your competitor stores. So that's pretty incredible. And it could have you know, information to say, you know, order online now for 20% off your purchase. But the system knows geographically where that individual is. So I think that's where things are going in the next three to five years, is there's so much more information that's going to be out there, but then also balanced by the privacy of individuals. You know, as soon as I say that, then as an individual, I think, well, do I want all these things out about me? So it'll be striking this balance where individuals will have the ability to keep whatever activity they want private and own that, 
But then the ones who are choosing to keep that open, they're going to have a really interesting, in my opinion, really valuable experience where in an ideal world, advertising is about showing you things I don't want. That's very useless in the 20th century. There should be this idea where advertising is actually really interesting and valuable information that's completely personalized and directed to me based on what I need at that moment. So stay tuned for that. I think that's going to be interesting for the next few five years. All right, so thanks again. Um, please reach out to me if you have any more questions or want to chat more. And uh, I'll see you guys next time. So thanks. thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about it. 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 I'm not going to tal